order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mike Penning. Number one, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will join me in remembering the life and achievement of Sergeant Stephen Campbell from 3rd Battalion, the Rifles, who died in Afghanistan earlier this week. We pay tribute to his energetic, his brave and his dedicated service. His infectious enthusiasm and his sincere patriotism will be sorely missed, and the thoughts of everybody in this House, I know, are with his family, friends and colleagues. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in the House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mike Penning. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in paying tribute to our armed forces, especially those that have lost their lives this week? And our thoughts and prayers are not only with those that have lost their lives and their family and loved ones, but those that have been injured as well. Last week, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister admittedly had misled the Chilcot inquiry about the funding for the armed forces. When did the Prime Minister realise he misled before or after he gave evidence? Mr Speaker, I, I, said, I said last week when I was preparing for last question time, uh, I was shown the transcript of what I said in the uh, Chilcot inquiry and I decided to make it absolutely clear on the first occasion to the House and then write to Sir John Chilka. But, but I, re I repeat, defence spending has risen in, by 12% in real terms. Every, every request by the Ministry of Defence and the commanders for funding has been met by the Treasury for the operations that have been conducted. And I have to say, Mr. S I have to say, Mr. Speaker, there was a 30% real terms cut in defence expenditure under the last years of the Tories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I, may I also pay my own personal tribute to those officers, all of them that we've lost, and pay my condolences to their families. I'm sure we miss them all. Uh, may I, Mr. Speaker, ask the Prime Minister why, in his view, fairness should be the hallmark of a good government? Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the importance that she and her constituents attaches uh, to the fairness measures that we've introduced. Uh, the child tax credit, uh, which has helped six million families in this country. The pension credit, which is helping two million pensioners escape poverty in this country. Educational maintenance allowances, which is helping half a million children go to school. I guarantee that young people under 24 will receive help and they will not be unemployed but will have training and work. Now these are the measures that have been put forward by my right honourable friend, the Chancellor. They could never have been put forward by the Shadow Chancellor. Mr David Cameron. Can I join, can I join the Prime Minister in paying tribute to Sergeant Stephen Campbell, who died in Helmand on Monday. We are paying a high price in Afghanistan. But our troops and their families need to know they have all our support and our prayers and thoughts are with those who will not come home. This is likely to be the second last Prime Minister's questions before the general election and clearly the Chancellor's statement is the main event of the day so this provides an opportunity to clear up a number of different issues. Can I, um, I'd like to, um, can I start with a simple one? <laughs> It's budget day, it is budget day, and there's a picket line outside the Treasury. So will the Prime Minister confirm that on this occasion he'd like people to cross it and go to work? Let, let, me, let, let me first uh, congratulate uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman and his wife on the good news about their, their baby. And let me secondly uh, thank him for getting near again to asking a question about the economy. Of course everybody is going to work here and we will continue to work for a Labour government and for jobs. I'm very grateful to the Prime Minister for his um, uh, congratulations. I've been, had lots of texts and messages uh, from many honourable members, most people focusing on how you find the time for these things, but I'm very grateful <laughs> none, nonetheless. Very interesting answer from the Prime Minister. Last week he wouldn't give any support to British Airways workers, but apparently the First Lord of the Treasury is content for his own workforce to go to work. Now, one of the things, in this spirit of clearing up a few issues, one of the things the Treasury are working on concerns the Prime Minister's disastrous decision to sell gold at rock bottom prices. Yeah. Losing. <laughs> this 
has lost the country £6 billion. The Treasury has now lost its four-year battle against the Information Commissioner to keep the information about this decision secret. So will the Prime Minister now confirm that these documents will be published in full with no redactions before the general election? Mr Speaker, I'm very happy for any document to be published on that matter. But, but Mr Speaker, but Mr. Speaker, he's got to do a bit better than that if he's talking about the future. I mean, rela relapsing into these issues, let me just remind him that we have taken people out of unemployment and into work, that we've helped thousands of small businesses, that we've been helping people against the loss of their homes. The Conservatives have got nothing to say about the present and the future. It's about time he started to think about the policies that work for the future. If the Prime Minister is so relaxed about this information being published, can he tell us why he spent four years fighting it? Uh, Mr Speaker, it is, it is a matter for the Information Commissioner and the Treasury. Mr, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, I am happy if the Information Commissioner wishes to publish documents, but I have to say to him, is he going to come forward with any serious policy about the future of this country? Has he got anything serious to offer this country for the future? Has he got anything to say to the unemployed of this country, or to mortgage holders, or to the businesses? The person who will be talking about the future is the Chancellor. The Shadow Chancellor has got nothing to offer. Really, that's it. The Treasury always wanted this information published, and it was only the Information Commissioner stopping them. <laughs> Once again, this Prime Minister takes the whole country for fools. Let's try, let's try another one. The Information Commissioner has also ordered the Department for Work and Pensions to release information on the Prime Minister's disastrous raid on every pension fund in the country. Now, the Information Commissioner has ruled in November this should be published. The Department has appealed against it. Now we hear they're not interested in these appeals. Will he withdraw that appeal and make sure the information is published? Mr. Speaker, we, we had a debate. We, we had a debate. The, the Shadow Chancellor may laugh. He was the subject of the debate in this House on these very issues, and he could not sustain his case about the dividend tax credit. We made the right decision for British industry. We made the right position to protect British pensioners. It is the Conservative Party that has let pensioners down, and would Doans do so in future by opposing many of the measures we've taken? I am happy for everything in my record to be judged. Now, let's see. Let's see. Let, let's, let's start with the Leader of the Opposition. Will he tell us what happened over Lord Ashcroft? Yeah. Yeah. Simple, simple question. If he's happy for this to be published, will he withdraw the appeal and have it published? Yes or no? Mr Speaker, we had this debate on pensions. Oh, yeah. We had this debate on pensions in this House of Commons. The, the, the Shadow Chancellor the Shadow Chancellor tried to pursue the case against our policy to withdraw dividend tax credits. He could not even make a sensible argument on that at the time. We won this debate on dividend tax credits because our policy was the right policy and it continues to be so. Mr. David Cameron. On the second last questions, we've just had what we've had all along from this Prime Minister. No answers, endless cover-ups, not giving the information, not answering the question, dithering on all the important decisions. How much longer are we going to have to wait till we get rid of this useless bunch of ministers? The cab meter's ticking. Come on, tell us when the election is then. He has been wrong on every single issue about the economy. When the people look at what the Conservative Party proposed, they will see they were wrong on Northern Rock, they were wrong on the restructuring of the banks, they were wrong on help for the unemployed, they were wrong on help for mortgage owners, they were wrong for help for small businesses, and when it comes to right or wrong, they were wrong on Lord Ashcroft. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That's the Conservative Party. Government backbenchers in particular must calm down. I'm sure they want to hear Fraser Kemp. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Six days ago, it was announced that the world's first mass produced affordable zero emission car would be made in Wearside by Nissan, yeah. securing and creating thousands of highly skilled manufacturing jobs. Can I ask the Prime Minister to ensure that the investment which has been committed to providing the infrastructure for charging points and the support to the British motorist who wants to switch to zero emission cars will be maintained and improved in the coming years to ensure that the UK can have its rightful place as world leader in zero carbon emissions? Let, let me thank uh, my honourable friend for what he has done and what Nissan has done to create the first mass marketed electric car in the United Kingdom. And that will mean not only safeguarding and creating jobs, it will mean 50,000 vehicles a year produced in the United Kingdom. Now, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that the one reason it was possible for Nissan to make this investment was that there was support available from government for the development of the new technologies that they're making. Unfortunately, the Conservative industry policy would withdraw support in the low-carbon areas. We are the party of jobs and building industry for the future. They are the party of unemployment. Yeah. Mr Nick Clegg. Yeah. I'd obviously like to add my own expressions of sympathy and condolence to the family and friends of Sergeant Stephen Campbell from 3rd Battalion, the Rifles, who tragically died this week after serving so selflessly and so professionally in Afghanistan. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, despite all the news about lobbying in Parliament, it hasn't been raised uh, yet today. That might be because when we put forward proposals to restrict lobbying yes. in Parliament, yes. they, they both yes. blocked us. When, when, we tried to give people, when we tried to give people the right to sack corrupt MPs, they both blocked us. When we wanted to clean up party funding, they both blocked us. Isn't the truth, Mr Speaker, that this Parliament will go down as the most corrupt in living memory because they both blocked reform? Mr Speaker, we have proposed and will implement a compulsory register of lobbyists. I have also made it clear that anybody who goes before the Business Advisory Committee as a former minister, they are compelled to take the advice of the Business Advisory Committee. In future, ministers will have to sign a contract in advance that that is exactly what they will do. We have taken action to make the system more transparent. We cannot, we cannot say anything other than the behaviour of the Members of Parliament who were dealt with in that programme was unacceptable. And I believe that the action that we are taking, because it diminishes us all, is necessary for the transparency that the public want. Mr Nick Clegg. Speaker, he's had 13 years to clean this up. Let's look at his record. Last summer, we had an amendment to introduce recall elections. Labour voted against. The Conservatives didn't turn up. Two days later, our proposal to cap donations. They both voted against. Our attempt to restrict lobbying in the Companies Bill. Labour, va Labour voted against us. The Conservatives didn't even turn up. Isn't this just a grubby stitch-up between two old parties who basically want to keep things exactly the way they are? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I rather think he prepared his second question before he'd heard the answer to the first. Because I made it... I made, oh, he didn't. I made it absolutely clear to him that any action that is necessary to secure proper transparency and proper accountability will be taken. That's why there will be a compulsory register of, of lobbying. That's why every action that will be taken by government ministers in relation to business appointments or former ministers will be transparent. Uh, and I think there is a need, if I may say so, for humility on all sides of this House. Mr Nigel Griffiths. The Prime Minister confirmed that unemployment in the United Kingdom at 8% is far below the unemployment rate in the United States of 9.7, in France of 10.1, in Spain of 18.8. .8. And will he assure the House that he will never adopt the policies of the Conservative Party that think unemployment is a price worth paying? Mr Speaker, unemployment is never a price worth paying. And I have to say to this House that the claimant count for unemployment is half today what it was in the recession of the 1990s. And I have also to say that unemployment kept rising for five years after the recession ended in the 1980s. 
Unemployment is now falling as a result of the action that we've taken. And whatever happens to employment and unemployment in the next few months, we have saved half a million jobs that would otherwise have been lost. Mark Pritchard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Given the need to restore faith in politics, could the Prime Minister assure the House that no Labour MP caught up in the Lobbygate scandal will be given a peerage? <laughs> let me... Let me... <laughs> talk, talk, talk about... Talk, talk about a known goal, Mr Speaker. Can I, can I just say to the Conservatives that the standards that will be applied in future to future membership of the House of Lords will be a lot higher than the standards that were applied to Lord Ashcroft. will want to hear Helen Southworth. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Task Force on Missing People has presented its recommendations. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, make sure that they're acted on to protect children at risk? There is no one who has uh, done more to stand up for the, the, the needs and the requirements of missing children than my honourable friend, and I think we des she deserves the gratitude of the whole House for everything that she has, has done. I did receive this week the report of the Missing People Task Force. Uh, the Government accepts fully all the report's recommendation, which sets out a plan of action to improve how agencies will respond when young people go missing and give the support that is available to families, should be available to families. We are committed, and I thank her for the way she has prosecuted this issue in the time she's been in this House. We are committed to taking these recommendations forward. Yeah. Mr Graham Brady. Yeah. Yeah. Which would the Prime Minister rather be remembered for? Doubling council tax or destroying people's pensions? Yeah. Next election. Patrick Hall. Order, I call Mr Patrick Hall. Mr Speaker, uh, I would like to inform the Prime Minister I would like to inform the Prime Minister that there are now nine Sure Start children's centres in Bedford and Kempston, yeah, yeah, yeah. delivering high quality, much respected and popular support to a wide range of families. Does my right honourable friend agree that to cut back from the universal service so carefully built up over the past decade would be a tragic betrayal of future yeah, yeah. generations? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, we have achieved our target of 3,500 Sure Start Children's Centre. They are now reaching 2.7 million children under five and their families. I understand that the view of the party opposite is that the Sure Start Centres should be restored to their original purpose, which only covered a minority of children. I say that the Sure Start Children's Centres are now vital parts of every single community, and nobody should tamper with the advances that have been made in helping children under five. Yeah. Mr Brooks Newmark. Yeah. He's now had a week to think about it. Will the Prime Minister now urge all BA staff to go back to work this weekend? Yeah. Yes, yes, Mr Speaker, and I have done so, and I have done so consistently. But he must, he must, he must. Uh, Mr Speaker, if the Conservatives want to turn an industrial dispute into some political provocation, they are going the right way about it. I would say that uh, any party that wishes to hold the government of this country should want to see an industrial relations dispute stopped, and they should want to see arbitration and negotiation take place, and they would want to bring this to a conclusion. And that's, after all, the view of the trade union envoy, who said it was the business of the Conservatives to help people get back into work. Sandra Osborne. Mr Speaker, a ban on methadone will come too late for my constituent, Jordan Kilty, who died last week at the age of 19. But will the Prime Minister give his assurance that when the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs reports on the 29th of March that he will act immediately to ban such legal highs? M M Mr Speaker, I, I too uh, am very concerned about what she has told me, and I send my sincere condolences to Jordan's family and to their friends. We are committed to preventing young people from, uh, pre preventing young people from starting to take drugs. 
The advice is clear that just because the substance is legal, it doesn't make it safe. But we are very concerned specifically about the harms of meth methadone. And the Advisory, Council, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs is considering this and similar compounds as an absolute priority. We will receive their advice on the 29th of March, and subject to their advice, we will take immediate action. We are determined to act to prevent this evil hurting the young people of our country. Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can the Prime Minister tell us when the more than 40,000 policyholders in Equitable Life, including many in Northern Ireland, who have waited many years for a satisfactory outcome, be likely to be informed of a positive uh, result, given that thousands of them have passed away since the company began, de began declining business ten years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand his, his question and the, the concern that is expressed to him by his constituents and others. The Government expects Sir John Trad Chadwick, who is undertaking this report, to submit his final report in May this year, and we have undertaken to provide, and we have undertaken to provide a response within 14 days of its publication. Sir Stuart Bell. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister confirm that, following upon the announcement of Total SA to develop the west of Shetland's gas fields of Lagan and Timor at a development investment of £2.5 billion, they have further passed an order with the chorus tubes to manufacture the gas pipelines at Hartlepool for an investment of £200 million. Is this not good news for Teesside and good news for the country? This is indeed very good news for the country, worth around 2,000 jobs as a whole. Uh, it is because um, uh, our recent tax changes have been able to support the development of remote deep water fields uh, that the uh, project announced by Total uh, can go forward. It has a development cost of £2.5 billion. Total has awarded a contract of £200 million to Chorus Tubes to manufacture the gas uh, uh, pipelines at Hartable. That means jobs in Hartable, means jobs in the North East, jobs in Scotland, 2,000 jobs in the UK as a whole. But it is because a government has been prepared to support, with tax reliefs, the development of North Sea oil and gas. Bob Spink. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the Prime Minister finds himself in Essex during April, and I suspect he might just do that, would he kindly drop in on Castle Point and meet the wonderful people of Age Concern, who would thank him for deciding to re-index the basic state pension back to earnings? Will he get on and do it quickly? Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I'm grateful for his invitation uh, to visit uh, him and to visit Essex, and I'm aware that he is a long-standing campaigner on these issues. Uh, I do pay tribute to the work that has been carried out by Age Concern. It is right that after the Turner report we made recommendations about linking pensions to earnings. Uh, I think he also recognised, however, that a lot of the work that helps pensioners is done by local councils, and I'm afraid that some Conservative councils are letting down the elderly. George Howarth. Speaker, the evidence economist Professor David Blanchflower has predicted that if the various measures that are currently in place to support people in jobs are withdrawn, unemployment could rise towards 5 million. What effect does my right honourable friend think it would have if a policy of cuts as a matter of principle were adopted and how would this affect the recovery in our economy? Mr Speaker, every uh, major country has made a choice about whether to continue the support for the economy that is necessary to ensure a recovery. Every, every major country in Europe uh, America, all the major countries in Asia have made that choice to support the economy so we can avoid rising unemployment and avoid unemployment getting to the levels of the 1980s and 1990s recessions. There is only one party that seems to stand out against that, wanting to cut now and cut at the expense of perhaps causing a double dip recession, and that's the Conservative Party. Dr. Julian Lewis. Number seven, Mr. Speaker. High quality inpatient care is one component of acute mental health services, supported by appropriate alternatives to admission. The government paper New Horizons, which you'll know of, published in December 2009, set out a cross-government programme of action, that is to improve the mental well-being of people in England and drive up the quality of mental health care. 
Dr Julian Lewis. This is where it's due, Mr Speaker. Under Blair's Britain, several first-class state-of-the-art mental health inpatient units were opened in or near my constituency. Under Brown's Britain, one of them has just closed and another is under threat. Instead of inpatient facilities, we're promised a shared dashboard of clinical performance quality <laughs> indicators. <laughs> is the Prime Minister happy to see frontline services replaced by management gobbledygook? Yeah. Well, yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I know he will want to be fair also. And the World Health Organization says that we are the best for the provision of mental health care. But obviously, obviously, every time we want to do better, since 2001, there has been a 50% increase in real terms investment in mental health. It is wrong of them to say that we are underfunding mental health. We are trying to do what we can and will continue to do what we can. And he should be fair in recognising that. Dr. Lynn Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Main House in Birmingham has been providing a much valued residential therapeutic service for people with a personality disorder since na nationally commissioned over 10 years ago. That service has just closed because when national commissioning ended, ministers' intentions that commissioning should be picked up regionally was not undertaken by the Strategic Health Authority. Will he look into what went wrong with a view to reopening the service as soon as possible? Well, Mr Speaker, I'd be very happy to look into it and I, I will ask the relevant minister to be in contact with her. David Amis. My constituent Mrs Ditchburn fled from Gran Canaria to the UK with her two children because she was involved in a violent and abusive relationship. Her partner has now invoked the Hague Convention and her children have been snatched back under terrible circumstances. Will the Prime Minister now take a personal interest in the case and assist Mrs Ditchburn to get her children back? I'm, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member. He, he gave me advance notice of this particular question he wished to ask. And I'm sorry to hear of the difficult situation between his constituent uh, and her husband about uh, the children. Uh, following an application under the 1980 Hague Child Abduction Convention on 17 March 2010, he will know that the High Court of England and Wales ordered the return of the children to their country of habitual residence. The children therefore returned to Gran Canaria on 20 March 2010. As the Honourable Gentleman will understand, it is not for me to comment or intervene in the decisions of the Court, but I will ask uh, my right honourable friend, the Justice Secretary, to look into this matter, and he will be writing to him very soon. Jeff Ennis. Thank you, Speaker. 82-year-old Mr Harold Billy uh, from Mumele, in my constituency, is supporting my campaign to scrap the derisory 25 pence age edition on state pensions over 80, which has remained at the same level since 1972, and replace it with an additional £25 per year on the popular winter fuel allowance. Will, my, will the Prime Minister have a, a, a word with his very good friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, to make sure that this measure is included in his forthcoming budget? Yeah. M M Mr Speaker, I, I do not uh, want to anticipate all the news that he will receive in the budget in only a few minutes, but I can say to him uh, that we have made sure over the last 10 years that pensioner households, indeed households over 60, have winter fuel payments every year and it is now at a record level of payment. And of course the Chancellor will comment on this in only a few minutes. The Reverend Ian Paisley. Yeah. I'd like to say that this is the last time I will bother this House with a question and bother the Prime Minister with a question, and I'm sure he's greatly relieved about that. <laughs> I would like to associate myself and my colleagues uh, with the words of condolence uh, spoken in this House today. This is a sad and tragic hour in our nation, and rumours of war and wars are common, and there is sorrow in hearts. Of course, they bury the dead, they put up the monument, but their heart is torn. And I have been in too many houses like that in the north of Ireland not to know how deeply the cuts are. I'd like to ask the Prime Minister that in view 
of the situation that we have here and its sadness and its sorrow and the dark shadow that lies upon the whole of our world today. Would he continue to give himself, as always, to the task of deliverance and victory and peace? And may it come speedily. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I think the whole House will want to pay tribute uh, to the Right Honourable Member for a long and distinguished uh, career, not just in this House, but in representation in a number of forums, including holding the position of First Minister of Northern Ireland. And I believe that the part he played in bringing the unionist community together, indeed bringing the whole community together in Northern Ireland, to ensure that we had devolution of power and to ensure now that we have completed the process of devolution of power, is one that uh, will adorn the history books in many decades and centuries uh, to come. So I think, Mr Speaker, on this uh, day and on this occasion, uh, I want the whole House to thank him for his service to this House and to the whole community. David Borrow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that no member of this House or the other place should seek to censor the BBC or the independent newspaper from questioning the involvement of Lord Ashcroft in, in alleged corruption scandals in the Turks and Caicos Islands? They, they don't like hearing the name Lord Ashcroft, but he is Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. And perhaps, perhaps their zeal for investigations uh, should extend to an investigation into Lord Ashcroft. Order. Time's up. We'll proceed to next business.